each other as individuals. I started a series of encounters called um, Racial Confrontation as Transcendental Experience. We thought that we wanted to get that kind of black-white confrontation so you could really get down to see what was between the two races, not by backing off and trying to be polite, but by going right into the belly of the beast, of this beast of, of racial prejudice. And these were extremely dramatic. These were the toughest workshops ever convened at Esalen Institute. I'm looking at you, whitey! You got clothes oh, on! So sure you got shoes me, huh? on! You're so sure looking at me, huh? You got the goddamn police in the neighborhood! Really? They're not my police. You got a governor! You got a mayor! Oh, really? You got the president! You, you got ambassadors! Too. You can vote, too. You got deaths in Vietnam! That's the benefits of slave labor! You got buildings, skyscrapers that you dominate and control economically and politically. And tell me that it's not yours. It's yours too. Then the blacks all got together and attacked the whites. And they just let us have it. What they call it was peeping somebody. Peeping somebody means uh, peeping into their secrets, into their phoniness and so forth. Like uh, the white liberal. Oh, they really, really got onto the white liberal, you know. So don't give me no shit about I'm free. You're a goddamn liar, you white pink son of a bitch, you. Yeah, I want to know what you came down here for. You want a black buck, huh? Yeah. You looking for a stud? Huh? Well, what did you come here for? You're sitting there with your legs all gap wide open showing your drawers. Now, what'd you come here for? The black-white encounter groups were a disaster. The black radicals saw it as an insidious attempt to destroy their power. By trying to turn them into liberated individuals, Esalen was removing the one thing that gave them power and confidence in their struggle against racism, their collective identity as blacks. For my reason. For your reason. My, my, I take this. Your reason for being here is different from my reason. So the human potential movement turned to another social group who they believed would benefit from personal transformation. Nuns. And this time, they were more successful. The Convent of the Immaculate Heart in Los Angeles was one of the largest seminaries in America. A group of radical psychotherapists approached the convent. They wanted to try out their techniques for personal liberation on individuals whose identities were defined by a series of external rules which they had deeply internalized. The convent, anxious to appear modern, agreed to the experiment. And we did weekend encounter workshops uh, for several hundred Immaculate Heart nuns. Nuns who were reserved, and they tended to be more reserved than other normal people, were told, don't be so reserved, let it all out. You're a good person. You can afford to be who you really are. You don't need to play the role of a nun. You don't need to keep downcast eyes. And uh, Prudence is uh, an oversold virtue. You're trying to um, assert yourself, trying to find out who you are, who you're becoming. At the same time, you're trying to live a life of dedication, of service, and you're trying to make all these things fit into who you are, and you're just, you know, it's just, it's such a turmoil at times that you just, you, you just blow a gasket and do silly, crazy things, you know running around the orchard and stealing oranges yeah. and taking Cokes out of the refrigerator and crazy things. I felt like I was being a hypocrite and I wanted people to respect me for what I was, not for what I was wearing. And so I'm glad for the change. You feel frightened, but you'll go on. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm scared to death, but, but it's worth it. The experiment began to transform the convent. The nuns voted to discard their habits in favor of ordinary clothes. But the psychotherapists found they had awoken other forces. Solid. One of the things we unleashed was sexual energy, the, the kind of thing that the church had been very good at restraining was no longer to be restrained. One sister who was a member of the community, she got the idea that she could be freer than she had been before and she seduced one of her classmates and then seduced uh, the mistress of novices who was an older woman, very reserved, and her program of freeing this older woman was sexual. She drove her to the store and when they drove back um, and drove into the garage she leaned over and gave her a big kiss on the lips and thereafter sister who had perhaps never been kissed before was ready for more. The effect of the experiment on the convent was cataclysmic. 
Within a year, 300 nuns, more than half the convent, petitioned the Vatican to be released from their vows. And six months later, the convent closed its doors. All that was left was a small group of nuns, but they had become radical lesbian nuns. The rest gave up the religious life. They gave up being nuns? They did, yeah, they became persons. By the late 60s, the idea of self-exploration was spreading rapidly in America. Encounter groups became the center of what was seen as a radical alternative culture based on the development of the self, free of a corrupt capitalist culture. We just want the freedom to, to be ourselves, and that's for love, for experience, positive way of life. We don't, we don't say uh, that you're wrong. We just want to be free to, to be what we want to be or what we find ourselves to be as we continue to search ourselves. And it was beginning to have a serious effect on corporate America because these new selves were not behaving as predictable consumers. The life insurance industry in particular was concerned that fewer and fewer college students were buying life insurance when they left university. They asked Daniel Yankalovich, America's leading market researcher, to investigate. He had studied psychoanalysis. The life insurance business, more than any other business at the time, was built on the Protestant ethic. You only bought life insurance if you were a person who sacrificed for the future. If you lived in the present, you had no need for life insurance. So they had some sense that maybe the sort of core values of the Protestant ethic were being challenged by some of these uh, new values that were beginning to appear. And I was really astonished at what I found. The conventional interpretation, the dominant interpretation, was that it had to do with political radicalism. But, you know, it was clear to us that that was a mask, a cover. The core of it had to do with self-expressiveness. That this preoccupation with the self and the inner self, that was what was so important to people. The ability to be self-expressive. Wow, what a feeling! 300 miles to go! What a sight! Yankelovich began to track the growth and behavior of these new expressive selves. What he told the corporations was that these new beings were consumers but they no longer wanted anything that would place them within the narrow strata of American society. Instead, what they wanted were products that would express their individuality, their difference in a conformist world, the very things that US corporations did not make. Products have always had an emotional meaning. What was new was individuality the idea that this product expresses me, and uh, whether it was a small European car, the particular music system, Relaxation. your presentation of self, your clothing. For immediate energy from our muscles and relaxation. These become ways in which people can expend their money in order to say to the world who they are. But the manufacturers, they had no idea of what was going on, really, in the, uh, with consumers and in the market at large. Major advertising companies set up what they called operating groups to try and work out how to appeal to these new individuals. The head of one agency sent a memo to all staff we must conform, he told them, to the new non-conformists. We must listen to the music of Bobby Dylan and go to the theatre more. But the problem was, few of the self-expressive individuals would take part in focus groups. The advertisers were left to their own devices. There's a new cereal that tastes so right. It makes you dance, it's a way out of sight. It's tasty little squares of malted wheat. It's crispy and it's crunchy and it tastes so neat. Faster though. That's what I'm saying. Use a folk rock with more rock than folk. And there was an even more serious problem. To make products for people who wanted to express themselves would mean creating variety. But the systems of mass production that had been developed in America were only profitable if they made large numbers of the same objects. 
this had fitted perfectly with the limited range of desires of a conformist society. The expressive self threatened this whole system of manufacture. And the threat was about to grow rapidly. Go! Because an entrepreneur had invented a way of mass producing this new independent self. He was called Werner Erhard. Some of the stuff that we traditionally think of as being in your mind is actually in the world, because you're moving to that too. Erhard had invented a system called EST, Erhard Seminar Training. Hundreds of people came for weekend sessions to be taught how to be themselves. And EST was soon copied by other groups, like Exegesis in Britain. Many of Erhard's techniques came from the human potential movement, but he criticised the movement for not having gone far enough. Their idea that there was a central core inside all human beings was, he said, just another limitation on human freedom. In reality, there was no fixed self, which meant that you could be anything that you wanted to be. The thesis of the human potential movement was that there was something really good down in there. And if you took these layers off, what you were going to wind up with was a kernel, a something that was innately self-expressive, that was the true self, that was going to be a wonderful thing. In actuality, you found people who'd gone to the last layer and took off the last layer and found that what was left was nothing. All right, push! Move! The S sessions were intense and often brutal. The participants signed contracts agreeing not to leave and to allow the trainers to do anything they thought necessary to break down their socially constructed identities. You're going to get sandwiched in there. Go for a win. If I push harder than you do, I'm going to squash you. So you better push fast. Now, hard, do it. That's it, do it again. Push, good, good, good. Again. Yes. The real point to the S training was to go down through layer after layer after layer after layer until you got to the last layer and peeled it off where the recognition was that it's really all meaningless and empty. That's existentialism's end point. S went a step further in that people began to recognize that it was not only meaningless and empty, but it was empty and meaningless that it was empty and meaningless. And in that, there's an enormous freedom. All the constrictions, all of the rules you've placed on yourself are gone. And what you're left with is nothing. And nothing is an extraordinarily powerful place to stand because it is only from nothing that you can create. And from this nothing, people were able to invent a life and allowing them to create themselves. Invent themselves. Invent themselves. You can be what you want to be. I want you to start to make that sound and on that sound, create and people the world the way you want to create it. What Earhart did was to say that only the individual matters, that there is no societal concern, that you living a fulfilled life is all you need be concerned about. Est people came out of those trainings feeling that it wasn't selfish to think about yourself, it was your highest duty. Kiss me and smile for me Tell me that you wait for me Hold me like you never let me go The training is, uh, is two weekends mm -hmm. and uh, it was quite an incredible experience in my life. I'll forever be grateful for the experience. I got a great deal out of it. We really want to know who we are. There are things going on. We learn more and more about us, ourselves all the time. 
and to really find out what it, make, what it is that makes us tick and how we are discovering the sound. Est became hugely successful. Singers, film stars and hundreds of thousands of ordinary Americans underwent the training in the 1970s. But in the process, the political idea that had begun the movement for personal transformation began to disappear. The original vision had been that through discovering and expressing the self, a new culture would be born, one that would challenge the power of the state. We will not let them separate our culture from our politics. We are a people. We are all together. But what was now emerging was the idea that people could be happy simply within themselves and that changing society was irrelevant. One of the proponents of this was Jerry Rubin. In 1968, Rubin, as leader of the Yippies, had led the march on Chicago, but now he had undergone S training. I was willing to die, and I, and I had a martyr complex in a sense, I think we all did, and I've given up that ideal of sacrifice. Um, and I, I'm not as... Um, I'm not as overwhelmingly moved by injustice as I was. And now we reincarnated ourselves from within. Basically, the politics were lost and, 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 and totally replaced by this lifestyle and, and then the desire to become deeper and deeper into the self. By now, a grandiose sense of the self. And my uh, a good friend uh, and uh, one of the original Yippie founders, Jerry Rubin, definitely moved in that direction. And, and I think he was buying into, beginning to buy into the notion that he could be happy and fully self-developed on his own. Socialism in one person. Yes. Was he alone in that trajectory? Although that, of course, is capitalism. <laughs> that's, that's the whole joke. <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> I think it's funny because people spend so much of their life being bedeviled by their past and being locked into their past and being uh, limited by their past. And there's an enormous freedom from that. Letting people create themselves. Est was only the most vivid and intense expression of an idea that was spreading rapidly through all strata of American society. Books and television programs promoted the idea that one's first duty was to be oneself. And those monitoring this shift were astonished at the speed with which the idea was spreading. In 1970, it was a small percentage of the total population, maybe 3 to 5%. By 1980, it had spread to the vast majority of the public, up to 80%. You ask the question, how do you get self-actualized? You take this day and you say, when I shave every morning, I look in that mirror, I say to myself, I really say this, I say, nobody is going to ruin this day for you, Wayne Dyer, nobody. That this preoccupation with the self and the inner self traveled and spread throughout the society in the 1970s. It helped me to stop living in the past and start building from today mm -hmm. and using my experiences in a positive way mm -hmm. to be a better person today and tomorrow. But then the problem comes, well, how do you be self-expressive? And it was at this point that American capitalism decided it was going to step in and help these new individuals to express themselves. And in the process, make a lot of money. The first thing they were going to do was to find a way of getting inside their heads, 